in the last few weeks, it's become very clear to me that the issue of voting is um, tied up quite intimately with the issue of trust. And so I've been doing a lot of research um, and talking to people and interviewing about the issue of trust and sort of how people decide to vote and, um, and where they put their trust. So I've written a thing uh, that I'm going to read to you. And then afterwards, I one thing I've noticed, I've been going to a lot of things everywhere I go, um, anytime there's like a QA, and a like 70% of people don't want to queue. They just want to tell you something or yell it at you because people, there's an overwhelming sense of not feeling listened to. And earlier today I was with um, Sarah Studeville who runs Seattle Globalist, another really great local independent media site. And uh, she was telling me that she feels that it's sort of our job as people who make stuff and people who do stuff to just sort of like be, you know, sort of the, sort of the, like catch all for people's frustration and, and the more we can volunteer ourselves to just like, yeah, just yell at me. Yes, just do that. So uh, what we're gonna do after I read this thing is um, you can ask me a question and I'll answer it or you can just yell something at me. You can vent your frustration. Like I'm, I'm allowing that to be part of what this is but do be aware, I think Michael Maddox is here, right? Michael Maddox can tell you that I yell back. <laughs> yeah, and I might boo you. So just like you like, it's a two-way street. So, uh, so I'm going to read you this thing, and then we'll, then we'll talk about it, okay? Everyone's down for this ride? We're all here? Thank you all for coming, too. I'm so, I, so many interesting people are in this room right now. Uh, more interesting than I am, but okay. Uh, in the month leading up to the incident, my phone was warm to the touch. Between my own compulsive checking of polls and data and the messages flooding in from every possible platform, that poor device spent late summer and fall working overtime. What do you make of this race? What's this candidate like? Where should I phone bank? Where should I donate money? So many people I knew, and honestly a lot of people I didn't know, were searching for answers about that huge ballot. I tried to do my best to answer truthfully and with nuance. As the last drops came in that Tuesday, the questions didn't stop, but they did change. Is this real? Can you believe it? And of course, what do I do? The election was over a month ago and it hasn't stopped since. Maybe you've experienced the same thing. Maybe you're the political friend, you're the comforting friend, the friend that serves as a touchstone for the people around you, or maybe you were the one tossing out lifelines, looking for light in the darkness. I have become convinced that most of us fall into one of two camps. There are people who are, as my friend eloquently put it recently um, in a conversation about this topic, uh, people who are anointed with the sacred trust, and then there are the people who look for these sources. Or maybe we all play both of those roles at different times, depending on the situation. In my role as a scholar in residence at Town Hall, I've learned several things. And one of them is that it is becoming increasingly more difficult to find local community programming and journalism that directly addresses local politics and specifically down ballot races that does not come directly from the campaigns. Uh, another thing I've learned is that in the era of fake news and Facebook e echo chambers, people want, and I would say I'd argue that they need, those programs and outlets more than ever. But perhaps one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that we are all set up to fail when it comes to determining who to trust and how to vote, in large part because we don't know where to turn to help us form our opinions as we cast our ballots. Voting is important and holy and necessary and righteous, and it is also tedious and time-consuming and tiresome and fucking boring. We vote on things that impact us, but we also vote on things that will impact people for generations. We vote on things that are so much bigger than we are. We vote for people we've never met and will never meet and can't possibly know. And we do it all based on a combination of secondhand information, what we can glean from the news, as well as what we learn through the game of telephone that is social media. Because let's be honest, none of you cracked your voters' pamphlets. When you pause for a moment and think about how much is tied up in a vote and how much it means to vote and how much trust is placed in the electorate, it should be apparent that there is a voracious appetite for answers. However, thanks to our human brains and our survival instincts, we are hardwired to look for answers that are validating, comforting, reassuring, and maybe as a byproduct informative, but not necessarily. When cable news chirons are the arbiters of fact checking, when readers put as much faith in the word of the New York Times as they do in websites they've never heard of, we seem to be a lost pack, unsure of which way is north or where the ocean is. We are without a compass and we're looking for guidance and we just want to talk and we just want to listen and we just want to find some semblance of information and we haven't been properly conditioned to know how to vet the information that comes in. I think a lot of us aren't even really sure where to begin. We like to think of ourselves as smart. A YouGov poll found that 55% of respondents believe that they're smarter than the average American. 
And we especially like it when other people think we're smart, which means we are more likely to trust people, information, and sources which make us feel and seem smart. Unfortunately, we don't know what we don't know, and sometimes we're not even sure what we think we know, which makes it hard when our ballots come in the mail and we have to dig deep and find an opinion about every issue and every person. To make sense of it all, instead of turning to trusting news sources, I have found in my town hall research that, uh, an emerging pattern. I believe that we are turning more to trusted people. As much as we wring our hands about personal, about personal feedback loops, it seems to me that they are less constructed of outlets we trust and more of a framework or web of people or at least personalities. But what is it that defines these people? Whose job is it and how can we ensure that we, if we are those people, are providing information that is quite literally trustworthy? Uh, so for starters, I think it's impossible to talk about trust and voting and the media without talking about money. It's abundantly clear that funding is a major issue in journalism. Uh, journalists face layoffs constantly. And it's also an unfortunate reality that campaign season is what keeps many news channels on the air. Wealthy donors have a, vest have a vested interest in keeping the coffers of packs full and the commercial breaks of your favorite singing competition choked with hit pieces. These are not unrelated circumstances. And there is indeed exponentially more money being pumped into messaging and coercing the story than there is reporting. But it's not just because so-called objective journalism, which I don't believe exists, has been slowly asphyxiated by PAC money. It is that we as consumers have not been clear in our desires or our expectations. It cannot be overstated, and I mean this, it cannot be overstated that the media does not drive itself. We drive the media we see. If you have ever snarked at someone for sharing a Kardashian-related story on Facebook, either to yourself or maybe sanctimoniously in the comments, only to go ahead and click through and read the entire thing, you have all but ensured that more Kardashian news will not only be produced and set free in the world, but that more of it will show up in your Facebook feed because now you have told both the purveyor of the story and Facebook itself that you do, in fact, enjoy Kardashian updates. Clicks are also the driver behind the epidemic of fake news. One proprietor of fake news told NPR that he makes between $10,000 and $30,000 a month. Yeah. <laughs> News creators, whether fake or otherwise, know their audience, they know how to drive traffic, and by default, they know how to stay afloat financially. You might not like the content, but if you're clicking on it, you're telling them to keep making it because it'll keep the lights on. This is true of legacy outlets, and it's true of newcomers, and it's true of local blogs with ads, and it's true of sites that exist solely to propagate incorrect information. If you exist in a mostly lefty world, i.e. you are not among the med heads downstairs, you know that's what his fans are called. Did you know that? Uh, you might not have been exposed to some of the worst fake news, um, all the fake news that everyone's talking about, right? And that's because of who clicks on it and who shares it. The arbiters of fake news have admitted that they gain more ground with conservative angles, telling an NPR reporter that liberals simply don't take the bait. Additionally, an independent analysis from, analysis from BuzzFeed found that the most, while the most while the most shared real news stories of the 2016 election cycle were largely in favor of Hillary Clinton or at least against Donald Trump, the most viral fake news stories were almost all just one was the exception against the Democratic nominee. So think about that for a minute. So I work in, I used to work in radio and uh, I get really annoyed when people's mouths are dry when they're talking. So, cause it makes a really gross sound. Uh, but fellow lefties, lest we get too smug, we are also every bit as guilty of looking for content which confirms our biases. Another independent analysis found that popular liberal leaning websites were often spreading at least the spreading just as inaccurate information. An investigation found that while 94% of CNN's posts to Facebook were factually sound, just 49% of the news from Occupy Democrats was. Close to 18% of the Facebook posts, Facebook posts from Addicting Info were a mix of true and false. And on the Facebook page for the other 98%, the posts which netted the highest engagement were those which were completely untrue. Overall, close to 20% of the content posted to left-leaning Facebook pages was either completely false or a mix of true and false. So that analysis only looked at posts to Facebook pages, which at a glance might seem like an incomplete data set. Um, you know, was the actual news article itself incorrect or maybe just the headline? Does not matter, actually, uh, because an estimated six in 10 social media users will share a link without reading the article, meaning the only information we have is what's in the headline. The boom in fake news, as well as the inclination to share without reading, you've all done it, is in part due to, well, six in 10 of you, I guess I could count, so <laughs> like that much of the room has done it. Uh, 
uh, is in part due to the money that stands to be made. The owners of these pages can charge thousands of dollars for one Facebook post. One Facebook post on Occupy Democrats will cost you $4,000. But it's also literally just to post something to their page and spread it. But it's also down to, I think, uh, oversaturation. We as a species want to be in the know, which means often we're trying to scoop up information on a lot of things at once from wherever we can get them. There is too much material flying around us at a given time, on a given day, to pause and be critical of the source. So we trust what sounds right, or we trust what comes from someone we know or think to be trustworthy. Conventional news is, of course, not without its flaws. The normalization of Donald Trump, the continued biases against black and brown people, the breathless coverage of live events without all the information, the unwillingness to fact check guests who actively spew racism and misogyny are all part of the reasons why Americans, and specifically younger Americans, are looking elsewhere for our news. And largely where we look is social media, which is just another way of saying that people are looking to each other, which should, should surprise no one considering the way our social brains operate. A Pew study from this year found that 66% of people say they get their news from Facebook. So a little more than how many people share things without clicking. Solid. <laughs> but just 12% say they actually trust the news they find there. Then again, only 32% say they trust the media at all. Although, if you believe Breitbart, a news website which has actively sought to undermine the mainstream news at every turn, you would see their reporting that less than 10% of the people trust the media. That figure is patently incorrect and is indicative of a broader problem, which is the epidemic of hyperpartisan websites and outright misinformation campaigns have sought to both convince the masses of things that are untrue while also undermining the collective trust we put in the media generally. It is a one-two punch to democracy and to literacy and it's one that has consequences. So I, I did a little bit of research into um, cognition as well just because I was thinking about trust and because I'm a fun person who studies fun things. Um, and, uh, oh man, it's, it's kind of, it, I'm a real optimist and it kind of brought me down. But, so the human brain tends to place a great deal of trust in people and personalities rather than actual knowledge. A 2012 study conducted by Mark, Microsoft and Carnegie Mellon found that a tweet from a person you like or trust is more likely to lend credibility to a story you see on Twitter than the author's demonstrated expertise. Right? So if the author is the most well-versed person, but someone you like tweets it, you are more likely to believe the veracity of that piece of information. In short, what we say is, I don't trust the media, or I don't trust news I get on Facebook, but what we demonstrate is that we trust some media, and we definitely trust media that's shared by our friends or people we admire. This is also why I think we like to turn to actual humans having actual human conversations, or at least actual humans having digital conversations. This explains the draw towards TV news, and it explains for the demand for local programming, and I think it demand, uh, explains the uh, surge in political podcasts. I don't know about you guys, but I was hoovering up podcasts that could best be described as people saying things I agree with. In the months leading up to the election, I'm doing less of that now. Determinations of trustworthiness are also hopelessly bound up in physical appearance and attraction. A 2014 New York University study found that we decide if a person can be trusted or not within milliseconds and that much of it is bound up in how conventionally attractive they are. High cheekbones, for example, make a person seem more trustworthy. A litany of sexist jokes aside, the fact that Fox News and its use of conventionally attractive blonde women is actually incredibly clever from a sociological standpoint, uh, particularly considering we tend to trust women slightly more about things, but not about their own experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a study for that. Uh, this is also why you trust people on Twitter who have more attractive photos and even news stories with stock images featuring better looking people. In many ways, we're also wired to seek out echo chambers, as much as we may shun the idea of them verbally, and it's why we tend to vote for candidates who confirm our beliefs in the world. The human brain is conditioned to listen for information. At a neurological level, we just really like to hear other people, especially people we like or trust, talking about issues we care about, particularly when they echo our own beliefs. Research published in 2009 found that when your brain hears a good story, uh, and one that it can particularly empathize with, it releases a little burst of oxytocin. A story or a particularly engrossing conversation or article can also put more of the brain to work, which makes it more interesting. This is why your voter's guide is so ruthlessly boring. But a panel discussion might be less so. Another issue with the voter's guide is uh, the reading level is too high. The average American reading level is about a seventh or eighth grade reading level. Uh, and the voter's guide, I ran it through uh, the um, Fleisch reading, readability score, and um, not great. 
Hmm. The voter guide? No, 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 the voter guide, no, the voter guide is like 13th grade. No, 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 the voter guide is, is written in very complex language that is very difficult for people to parse out. Uh, this is also why we're drawn to uh, magnanimous candidates like Barack Obama, but less wowed by low-key orators, <clears throat> like the mayor. <laughs> Tuning things out that you don't like or don't want to hear is actually a survival mechanism. Your brain tries to conserve resources by not releasing that oxytocin. It wants to hold on to it, which means it prizes information that, it seems, that seems important and it shuns the rest. And it's much easier to find inf important information or to find information important uh, when it plays well with your existing neural pathways. The reason metaphors work so well is because they help your brain draw connections. Similarly, news information that's connected to something you already know is more likely to respond well with your brain. Additionally, your brain responds well and with pleasure when, here's something that will surprise nobody, you are the subject of conversation. Information that conflicts with your worldview is decidedly not about you, does not center you, and does not validate your experience, so you're more likely to dislike it because it is not creating a joy and pleasure response. When Donald Trump says America isn't great, the brains of people who feel that it isn't great are engaged. When he stokes the flames of xenophobia, it confirms the existing fears of voters. It doesn't matter that, that he has very few trust indicators. His platform, in many ways, speaks directly to the needs of the brains of his supporters. This is also why the idea of identity politics is not only dismissive to large portions of the population, it also ignores the science. Voters do trust people who look like them, sure, but more than that, they vote for candidates who can speak to their lived experience. When you see your lived experience in a candidate or in issues, you're more likely to feel positively toward that candidate or issue, and as such, build trust. Uh, in, local in local elections, issues of trustworthiness are slightly mitigated. Um, instead of relying on sensational national news, it's easy to host debates, write editorials, which contain primary information from people we personally know and trust, and even possibly meet the candidates or the campaign managers. Unfortunately, a lot of local programming is fairly rote. Um, having worked in and covered campaigns, I can tell you that a debate you see on KCTS 9 will be remarkably similar to a debate you see on City Inside Out, which will be remarkably similar to a debate you see on KOW. You hear it, I guess. This is because campaigns have talking points that they want to hit and they have messaging that works. And some of that can be useful. Often debates uh, press candidates or campaigns to answer harder questions and give answers that you might not have heard otherwise, but it still leaves a kind of void which I think community assets can fill with a larger degree of uh, interactive, organic, and accessible conversation. I know that talking about politics is taboo, or maybe it used to be. I think we're past that now. But it's become clear to me in my time at Town Hall that people just really want to talk and listen about local politics. If you've ever attended a panel, uh, oh yeah, here we go. If you've ever attended a panel where the Q&A devolved into a series of people giving their own opinions in the form of a question, you know that there is a deep desire just to talk about it, which is what we're doing here tonight. Local politics is also less splashy than a lot of other subjects, and it's also frequently more granular. When everything is all caps important all the time, when it's all flooding in so quickly, it is incredibly difficult to determine the hierarchy of importance. Our time, our attention, and our resources are finite. And honestly, it's just easier a lot of the time to delegate the thinking to someone else. And I think that explains a lot of what we seek out, whether it's a panel at town hall, a conversation among friends, a direct connection over a Facebook messenger, or a news article with a headline that makes us feel good about our worldview. Sometimes we just need someone else to help us make sense of the complicated parts of the law and politics. Yes, our vote is our sacred bond with democracy, but good Lord, have you seen how many things we're expected to vote on? And seriously, like, we're in Washington State. Y'all got to vote at your dinner table. Could you imagine having to stand in line to vote on a ballot that was as tall as I am? Like, fuck. Dude, everybody else needs to get on vote by mail. So that leaves us with something of a question. Where do we go? How do we as voters know where to place our trust? What do we do now, and how do we ensure that the electorate is making its decisions, which is to say instilling its trust, in the people and campaigns that will, res will result in the most good for the most people? These, of course, that's why we vote. We vote to influence the future. We vote to have our say in the collective next steps. To start, this is the part where I answer the what do we do question. To start, we must expect more of our local service providers and give them the tools to do it. Whether it's nonprofits, tech innovators, or media, I believe that we've allowed, by voting with our clicks and our dollars, the vacuum of media space to be taken up with untrustworthy sources. It is time to invest in the organizations and systems that we love, including democracy itself and the media as an extension. This year's Southern California Public Radio, uh, KPCC, created a human voter guide program, which included a hotline and call-in shows where people could directly ask their questions from a trusted source. 
This is what media outlets can do when they're supported and when they're empowered and when they know people want it, which I think that we know that they do. We also used to have something like that. For six years, the city of Seattle was blessed with the Citizen Powered Living Voters Guide, a joint service of the UW and City Club, which provided fact checking from the public, from the public library. It was a valuable, information-rich source that learned and acquired information. It was discontinued this year, and I think this election cycle might have been different if it was still around. But donating to public media and attending events and voting with your clicks and dollars may still not feel concrete enough. I suspect that's why on election night and beyond, I've received so many questions asking, what can I do, where do I go? I suspect that's probably why some of you are here too. So my answer has been, and it remains the following. Find one thing you really care about. Then find a provider or an organization who focuses on that. Give them your time and your energy and your attention and your money. Do it because warm bodies on the doors can make a huge difference, but do it too because it's a public service to create an army of well-informed voters who can use their trust capital to combat false information. Dedicate to one thing and become the expert on it in your circle. Be the trusted friend on that issue. In doing this, you become an essential part of our web of information in the city and in your online spheres. In the last few months, it has become increasingly clear to me that this is essential. Attend panels, volunteer, read articles, talk about it. If you feel like you can't trust anyone, it is essential that you become trustworthy yourself. It's not enough to simply mourn the death of media or services or to wring our hands. We can only yell about fake news so much before we have to provide something real to replace it. We vote every year, several times a year, Every year, <laughs> several times. And we need to be prepared with information. Much as we have put our trust in each other, we have to put our trust into providers and systems. Or maybe we have to begin rebuilding that trust entirely. But whatever it is, it can't start until we're trustworthy ourselves. OK, that's what I wrote. So <laughs> does anyone want to yell out a question at me? Yell it. Well, it's not so much a question at you as much as it's uh... It's a book recommendation to the room. Uh, the Political Brain okay. It's the best book on politics I've read in a very, very long time. And it actually does address why we vote the way yeah. we vote All in, right. in, a, in a very scientific and technical way. All right, but, Political Brain. Yeah. I'm going to add it to my wish list for my local independent bookseller. Who else wants to yell something? So, should I be subscribing to the Seattle Times to support local journalism? Oh, that's such a dicey question. Oh, that's such a hard question. I'm, I, I say yes, and here's why. Because if you are a subscriber, you have a lot more leg room when you want to bitch about what they're doing wrong, right? Like if you're not a subscriber and you're like, Rah, they're like, I, don't, I already don't have your money. Um, if you are a subscriber, you have literal currency. In, and, and the other thing is too, the Times, they are wrong very often. But one, uh, a stop clock is right twice a day. And two, uh, they have been movable. We saw this year in this election cycle that they finally came around on the minimum wage. A hundred years later, fine. But, uh, but I do find that they're movable too. And, and write mean letters to the editor. Journalists are people. We hate getting yelled at. Yell. But is it a better use to give your money to the Seattle Times or an organization like the South Seattle Emerald? That's a good um, question. Like if you have like a finite, like if, you're, if your media money is finite, in that case, I'm gonna say go with the independent media every time. Yeah. If you, like, if you only have like $20 a month you can spend on media, I'm gonna say go to the independent ones that you really trust first. And the ones who are doing like really real work, I would say South Seattle Emerald is a good one, Globalist is good, I think Crosscut's mostly good. Um, Although Crosscut doesn't need your money as much anymore. They got that sweet, sweet KCTS9 money, so. <laughs> All right, who else has a question for me? Alyssa. Okay, I, I happen to love the voter pamphlet because you know there's something weird in there every time. It's true. There um, is weird yeah. stuff in there. Good it's, like, stuff. it's like the gems inside. But I'm wondering, what do you think could be done to improve the voter pamphlet, make it something that people open, not just because it's weird? That is a good question, and I've been thinking a lot about this. So. It is up to campaigns and candidates to, to sort of bring together their arguments for voter pamphlets. And I think one of the issues is the people who work in campaigns don't always have a super open worldview about who's going to be reading and who the voter is. And so we have this sort of tradition of writing for, like, you know, your grandmother. I don't know. 
like a like a old white lady in Wallingford. And I think um, I think part of that is down to getting different people involved in campaigns, but I think it's also something that we need to be taking up with the local elections office. Just that like accessibility is a real issue. I mean, even getting you know campaign material translated into different languages has been a struggle, um, and that's something that like One America and some other organizations have worked on. But um, you know, there's like 12 languages I think in Seattle that are spoken like with regularity, and it you know it, it would be great if those were all present. But then it would be like a f***ing phone book, so then you'd have to you'd run into how much the shipping cost would be. So. But uh, elections, I think. But I have been thinking on that. I don't have a super firm answer for you, but that is something I've been thinking a lot about. Who else? You can just yell. Uh, would we be better off as a state in Washington if all of us gave our money to journalism in Spokane, for example? Ooh, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, that's a hard thing. The harder issue with, like, the red parts of the state is also where our parties are spending their money. So, like... It would be cool if we were spending more money on races, like, and trying to, even if they're not necessarily winnable, but like growing more democratic momentum. Um, yeah, that's a hard one because there's not as much. I mean, in Seattle, we're so blessed. We have so many like, of, like nerds like me who are just like, oh, I'm just going to write about stuff because I don't have anything better to do. Um, so I don't. I mean, it's hard too because the the daily papers in places like Spokane are also. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it, my personal advice is if you're going to give some money specifically with the intent of helping, uh, like the redder parts of the state, donate to campaigns for compelling righty candidates. Summer. So can we talk comments? Because yeah. there are some places where I know never, ever, ever to read the comments. And then there are some blogs or some places where the comments are as enlightening as the article itself. Yeah. I, uh, so we don't have comments on Seattleish because I honestly think comments are a garbage fire. Um, my personal advice to anyone who's ever like, well, I want to leave a comment on your site. And I'm like, cool, go blog about it. Like, go start your own blog. Um, <laughs> but I think, especially now that, um, I feel like a lot of those conversations happen on Facebook now, which is a little more controllable. So the one time I would say it's okay to have comments is if they're linked to someone's Facebook account because then also you have like a name and a face. Um, and I like, one thing I used to really like, to, I don't do this anymore, I'm just as petty, but I just don't do this one particular thing. Um, I used to go through and friend people who would say really shitty things on articles that I wrote. Because <laughs> uh, we used to have Facebook comments and I thought it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> so uh, the only time I'm okay with comments is when they're tied to someone's Facebook. But in general, I, here's the other thing. I think it's really shitty to have someone like a reporter or a writer like do all this work, do all the labor, do all the research, and then have some dip in shoreline like I don't like it. Like I don't like I don't like giving them a platform. So uh, so I'm generally opposed to comments. And also my blog is not for people to fucking opine on. It's for me to opine on. Yes. In terms of Facebook, Twitter. Uh, What's your prediction for what's going to what's occur with social media? Yeah, that's hard. I know. And how, and how could it be changed? I mean, so on, a, on like a huge level, like if I had my druthers, one thing I would be recommending is that our public schools have media literacy as like part of their basic education. Um, so that's like on a big, that's like a big in, in my world. Um, that's not going to happen. No, no, certainly not. <laughs> Certainly not. Although I do, although I do trust, I do trust the younger generation to get it. Like kids who have come up with the internet, I feel like they get it a little better. Like you know, who doesn't share ridiculous fake news? Teenagers, because <laughs> they're not on Facebook. Yeah, because they know better. Because Facebook is for nerds and old people like me. Um, but I, I mean, there's been increasing pressure on obviously Zuckerberg um, to crack down on Facebook. And, and try and figure out how to filter out fake news. You can report it now, which is concerning, actually. I feel like that's going to be abused a lot. Um, I'm not a developer, and I'm not a especially tech-savvy person, um, but what I am savvy about is, is media literacy. And so my hope is that all of this attention that's being shined on fake news is at least maybe going to help people be better readers, uh, but that could be wishful thinking. My bet is that there's going to be a big campaign 
rather insidious one against the media literacy. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that, and that's already happening. Yeah. That's why, yeah, well, that's why when, you know, when hyperpartisan websites report that nobody trusts the media, it's that collective mentality that's like, nobody trusts the media, so you shouldn't either. Like, that's what's not being said. And so, like, the undermining of the media has become incredibly dangerous. And again, it's not always for poor reason, too, because sometimes CNN is f***ing terrible. Like, there are a lot of ways, and so, um, uh... What's the name of the theory in media? The whatever window? Anyway, um, so help, thank you. Uh, that when you, when you put something, regardless of whether it's correct or not on TV, it becomes more a part of the zeitgeist, right? And so this was something, the example I keep using when I talk about this, because I've been trying really hard actually to like hold our local media to this, which mostly just involves me tweeting mean things, so I'm being very productive, <laughs> and again, petty. Um, during the campaign um, for 1515, the trans bathroom bill, all of the news sites felt the need to have both sides present, right? And so they would have like a, like a, a trans person or an activist being like, I just want to go to a bathroom. And then they would have like Joseph back home being like, ew. And that lends legitimacy to the Joseph's back home of the world. Um, and so my hope is, that we are also going to see a turn towards the media being more trustworthy of themselves in what they normalize and what they sort of perpetuate. Uh, I've noticed that uh, Facebook is starting to get hit and the people that use Facebook about fact checking. So a lot of times uh, I'll see some news out there that immediately somebody will make a comment and link to Snopes.com or like in their middle on Facebook, they have their little advertisements of suggested things, mm -hmm. and it will be Snopes a lot of times. Interesting. I think you're right, and I think, and that's what I'm hoping, is just the more and more, you know, I, obviously, like, NPR has gone hard on the fake news thing, which I actually think is one of the cleverest things they could do to both reinstate trust in them as an institution and also educate the masses about which sites are fake. Like, I've, I've seen more and more people getting critical about that, but... I hear what you're saying with everything, but I think you're looking at it more from like the liberal stance. Like, yeah. I'm, what incentive would CNN or Fox have? Like NPR is our site, right? You're so of course sure. they have incentive to like actually report things that are like valuable, mm -hmm. right? CNN doesn't really, nobody should be watching CNN anymore. It has no meaning whatsoever. They're going to choose the money every single time. Yeah. Maybe they made like Donald Trump's ex campaign manager, like, you know, their chief correspondent. Oh my God. Like whatever. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. saying like for the parts of the state, like, on a broader view, this election has showed like America is extremely fractured, right? Sure. And you spoke earlier about how like we should be like more focused. And I don't know if like being an ally is the correct term, because I think people who voted in this election for that individual don't really need an ally. I don't think that they really need a voice that way. They do need education, right? Yeah. So if like they're in this little echo chamber, chamber like vacuum of just like this is what I believe in the media is lying to me, like I feel right now what we should be doing as the coastal elites is finding some way to educate, like, I just, I guess that's what, you're right, like, I told the came here to be like, what can I do? Yeah. I guess I'm trying to figure out how to get that portion of America to realize that yeah. we're not all assholes who think we're better than them. <laughs> yeah. We really just want them to be, like, educated. Because I think one of the most heartbreaking things about this past election is now, like, I've been reading a lot of things, like, in NPR and in, like, the, um, I'm from D.C. originally, so Washington Post, but all these people who voted for him who are now, like, freaking out about their Medicare being caught because, like, Obamacare is going, and I just sit there and I go, Moral. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. But I, I, I shouldn't think that. I, should, I guess like that's one of the thing. Like, what do you do as a person who is voting with more, more of your brain? I hate to say that, but it's true. With more of your brain to help the other side of the country yeah. realize they should be voting with a little bit more of their brain too. Yeah. Without I, moving for crazy stakes, I'm not going to do that. I know, right? Isn't that the part? That, there's, there's always, there is that part of me that I'm just like, God, fuck. Maybe I just. Maybe I just moved to Louisiana and just like start like the one like the <laughs> one person party like just like the blue bleed. But um, I think so. This is a time when I, one thing I'm going to tell people to do is just donate money if you have it, and donate time if you have it. Like there are organizations that are doing this on the ground. There are people who already live there who are doing that work. You know, I think um, I've seen so many more people 
encouraging, you know, donations to Southern Poverty Law Center and like organizations that directly do work. Um, yeah, and it's hard because you're right, like some people are are already so closed away. Although I would say, one, I think you're also right in that, um, you know, whenever someone says like, devil's advocates, like that asshole is well represented. You are right that those people do not need necessarily an advocate. Um, they are also a, I think it's important to remember that a minority of America voted for Donald Trump, right? Like I think we need to say that because it's not that more people voted for him, it's that voter suppression was a gigantic issue. It is that education, as you say, is a huge issue. And those are things that we can solve by targeting politically, but those are also things that we solve by fully funding education, by uh, like lobbying our lawmakers to pass a Voting Rights Act <coughs> that is robust, um, and, and then dedicating, you know, or like committing any funds that we have, any extra money that we have in organizations that specifically work to help get new Americans registered to vote. And um, I think it's really easy to sort of like zoom in on like the next election, but I think what we have learned is that there is a much more macro issue at play that has to do with, like you said, education. And I think like, I think, you know, a, a tax base that can actually pay for public education is gonna be one of the best tools that we have. But how do you do that like states, I did AmeriCorps for a year yeah. in Louisiana, right? They don't have money, no. like they'll never have no. money. So how do you do I mean, that? How do you educate that populace if the best, their money yeah, is not there? I, know. I think one of the best things we can do too is model in Washington State as best we can too. That's the other thing is if we in Washington State can be a model for funding mechanisms for like doing things like raising the minimum wage and then demonstrating that it works because then that goes down in the history book is like that form of economics works well to make sure that our kids are learning. And so like the other thing shy of, yeah, moving to the Mississippi River Delta and like trying to teach children. Um, I don't know how helpful I would be at that. Um, I think being really involved in our state, because Washington is gonna be an example. Like, why, like when the rest of the country is in shambles in a few years, I am a firm believer that Washington State is gonna have taken the right turn in a lot of ways and that we're gonna be taking care of our own in a really good way. And it's unfortunate that that is like kind of a selfish way to think of it, but I also think that like if, it, if those numbers add up, that's pretty positive. But they don't though. We have the biggest school layoffs in 40 years coming. Like, well, that's because our tax base. That's because our tax base looks more like Kansas than it does like. Exactly, but we gotta fix that. that. We gotta fix that. Well, that's what they're working. That's what All in Washington is working on right now. They've been doing a listening tour of Eastern Washington, finding out what people think and know about the tax base. Um, and largely, people believe that Washington actually has tons of tax revenue. We're just wasting it, which is <laughs> incorrect. Um, and that's why, you know, things like today, the governor released his, his tax plan to fully fund education and it's a carbon tax, which is lit. And it's an increase, it's a small increase in the B&O tax, which is great. Like, it's a really cool tax plan. And so like, I mean, in Washington state, revenue is going to be the single biggest issue in 2017. Like that is going to be what the ledge has to deal with. Not just because of McCleary, but because we literally can't fund any of the programs that we need to. Go. What are your solutions for generating revenue for the digital journalism and the new business model? Man, I don't know. We don't advertise on my site. I don't, I've never drawn a dollar from Seattle. Which I've literally never made any money from the site. <laughs> I've made no money from the website. I've spent money on the site. Um, because to me, trying to fund it was literally just too difficult. Like I was just like, I just, I don't. I don't know. That's actually one I don't have a solution for. Because people have to pay for media and they don't want to. I want to ask about building trust in the media. And I think it's something that you've done really well in the way that you've been really authentic and the way that you've really had your own voice in the media that's really sort of in contrast to the Seattle Times, which can be really robotic and objective. Sure. I think the Strangers had a similar kind of style where people trust them because they sound like real people. Yeah. Can you talk about how media can build trust? Yeah, so what you're talking about is, I think what we refer to as advocacy journalism, which is just a fancy way of saying we're not f***ing around with objectivity because that's not a thing like I like literally like I've yelled about this into many microphones at many different junctures but I don't believe that objectivity is a thing um, because what we think of as objective is white dude objectivity right like that's what we think of when we think of objective news journalism it's not what's objective to me is not objective to anybody else so to pretend that I somehow could be is I think incorrect um, which is why I have just not tried to do that. I was like, I'm just not, like, I'm like, I'm not gonna lie to kick it. So I, the way that I have tried to establish trust is 
One, I show up to a lot of stuff. Like I try and meet, I know we were joking earlier, Ben, that we hadn't met in person before tonight, but I do try and meet a lot of people in person because I feel that one of the best things about hyper-local journalism is you know the person who makes it. Um, and I, I like knowing the people who are doing the work because I know that they also like represent my best interests too. Like it's a lot easier to do reporting or to do writing that takes good care of your community when you care about your community and when that reflects back on you. Um, so I think that's a real push for hyperlocal journalism. And I was talking today, I was with Marcus Green today of the Emerald and uh, we were talking about, I know we all love Marcus. Do give your money to the Emerald if you can. He, they actually make money on their site too. So, and he, that's, he actually draws a paycheck from that site. Um, but we were talking about how that's one of the best things about hyperlocal journalism. And the other thing is too, you know that the information is good when you're doing hyperlocal. Like, I can get good information about stuff because I'm going to the source and then I'm like, it's the least number of points between the source and you, the reader, um, which I think is really useful. Um, and then I also just think, as I have again yelled many times about the best life hack is just being a, a person. And I think the more that we allow journalists to be people, the better. I think that's again why people like you know, a lot of like the NPR podcasts where you can actually like hear people talk and, and have a personality and, and you can kind of get a better sense of who they are because there is no such thing as an objective piece of writing. And so um, you just have to trust that you, that the person who's writing it is, you know, similar to you and, and maybe is also like hopefully a good hearted person. Ben. So is that going to be true nationally and how do we get into um, the hyper local politics in some town in Alabama? Oh man, there's a part of me that just is like, you know what, that's not for me to deal with. Like there's a real part of me that's like, I can't, I can't, I, I, like that's not for me. There's got to be some person, you know, like me in Chattanooga who needs to, who should be starting a blog. Um, so the other thing that um, Sarah from The Globalist told me today was she thinks that um, journalists need to be better about being educators about how to do what they do. And so, um, and I'm a very firm believer that um, journalism and writing is not a zero sum game. I think there is plenty of it to go around and I think there's plenty of work and I don't agree with the competitive nature of it a lot of times. Um, and so I, the best, I mean, the best thing I can offer someone is just be like, here's how to find the kind of primary information that I write about sometimes. Like here's how to do a PDR. Here's how to look at, you know, FEC campaign finance information um, and, and tell people who want to get into it how to do it. I should probably be doing a better job of that outside of the city, and I don't. But if anyone wants to start a blog, get at me. I'll tell you how. And I'll tell you how to not make any money at it. You're welcome. So as a, a follow-up, yes. how do we get your method to someone in Chattanooga? Yeah, that's hard. Get them interested and get them... I mean, you know, I found, I found journalism when I was a teenager, and we had a low-power FM radio station in the computer lab of my junior high in Eugene, Oregon. And um, that was when I sort of figured out that that was something I wanted to do. And so again, I'm gonna say it has to come, it's public education. All of these things come from public education. School newspapers, like that's when you learn. Like when you get your first pica ruler and you're like, fuck yeah, and you're doing layout and it's like print night, like that is, that is it. And so, um, and that's also, you know, that's a big, um, that's also another reason I would say um, I really like when people incorporate the A in STEAM education, you know, instead of STEM, um, because I think the arts are a way that you get people to care enough or want to do the thing. I'm positive other people want to do it, they just maybe don't quite have the tools. And it's, there's a huge learning curve. Everything I wrote for the first 10 years was terrible, so. Uh, Serena. Uh, you brought up Washington being an example, and this year we passed an initiative for voting vouchers. Yeah. Um, how do you think that local media and candidates might use that or change the way that we are influenced to vote and give our vouchers. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting, isn't it? Um, well, so we've already seen John Grant, who's like sort of shown, like he's he started it off, which I think is great. Like whatever happens with his race, like he really leapt on it really early. Yeah, the democracy vouchers are super interesting. I think that's, I think that's going to be a long learning curve. Like I think that's going to take some time for people to get because they are weird. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we were, just, we were just talking about them before the thing. And I, well, 
So one interesting thing about the democracy vouchers this year is it's going to be in a year where it's really just going to be about the city council race. Like that's pretty much because you can't use them for the mayoral race, which, by the way, sucks, but it's fine. Um, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Um, so I think I'm really looking forward. And I'm, I'm a, a person who just really enjoys data. I'm looking forward to seeing the data on like which candidates draw the most vouchers. And I think it's really going to be on the candidates and the campaigns to remind people that that's like a thing. Uh, and the smart candidates will do that and the smart campaigns will do that. And they will remind people that that's a resource that they have. But I'm really interested to see who draws those and like who, who is a voucher candidate because I think that's interesting. Tomasa. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts uh, related to what you said before about, you know, a lot, a lot of the deltas, uh, a lot of the influence points around trust being related to, like, physical attractiveness and all these sort of, you know, privilege points, if you will. Like, so how, how do you yeah. leverage that and trade on that in the ways that are strategically necessary to get, to move the ball where we want without just perpetuating a lot of the same like, systematic stuff. Oh man, yeah, that's such a hard thing. You know, that's one of the things that people talked about a lot um, with Barack Obama when he was first running, was that he had to really kind of walk a very tense line of like, likability, quote unquote. And, um, and I think, yeah, that's a hard one. That's, I've, so every candidate is very conscientious of their image, right? And there's some things that you can control and some things you can't. Um, I will, it, should I ever run for office, I'm not going to be able to control the fact that I look like a child um, and that people often mistake me for an intern. Like that's just, that's just part of it. Um, and so every candidate has their sort of unique challenge points and then above that we have these sort of overarching um, systemic issues of, of trustworthiness and likability. Um, obviously we know that. Um, like I said, there's the stat, you know, people trust women about things a little bit more, but they don't trust anything about their lived experience. And what that means, though, is because a lot of trust in politics is about lived experience, that we actually don't trust female politicians as much, right? So this is always a difficult line. And I think the best thing that we can do is investigate our own biases when we realize that we're having sort of an immediate reaction to a candidate and be like, huh, that was weird. Why did I feel that way? Why do, why do I not trust this candidate? What is it about them? What are those trust indicators? Um, and then I think that's also one of the jobs of the media is to, is to not sort of perpetuate those fears. Because that's the other thing. is like when people were just like, when, when CNN, you know, was just saying as a blanket statement, like, voters don't trust Hillary Clinton. And it's like, well, one, statistically, they did. And two, again, by putting that out into the world, now you are, like, sort of putting that thought into people's heads. Um, and so I think that's also on the media. This is why we should listen to CNN. This is why we should not listen to CNN. This is true. I'm going to bring it back to trust, too. Do you trust the media that we currently have to cover the Trump presidency and the administration? And if so, yes, if not, why not? I, I trust some outlets to cover him, yeah. I, you know, I will look forward to many Atlantic articles, I'm sure. Um, I am hoping that this sort of come to Jesus moment that has just occurred in the last month is perhaps going to spur some different kinds of coverage. I think a lot of newsrooms looked around in early November and said, what did we do and how did we get here? Um, I do think that NPR has been crushing it pretty well, which is cool. Um, I also, but the other issue is too that newsrooms are still overwhelmingly white and male, right? Um, which uh, journalism programs are not overwhelmingly white and male. And so I think another big part of rebuilding trust in the media is going to be um, actual, like not just like diversity in newsrooms, but like actually an emphasis on hiring people and, and creating positions. You know, I saw a position today for Mike.com. They listed a job posting that was a part-time job where you had to assign and edit and post 10 articles a day and write two articles a day of your own. This is a part-time job. 
And I would be lying to you if I said I didn't have a job that was almost identical in description at one point when I was a freelancer. Uh, and so I do have trust in some media organizations, but again, I also have trust in people. You know, I can't wait to read what Ta-Nehisi Coates has to say. Um, but that gets harder when there are fewer of them to choose from. Um, and so that's really difficult. And it's hard too, you know, I went, I've gone to now, I'm gonna blow up town hall a little bit. I went to a Journalism So White panel here and not once did they talk about journalism salaries as an issue of why journalism is full of white people. And I was like, no, those lines are intimately connected. Um, and so uh, I also, I think we all need to be just demanding more of our journalistic outlets and that they actually pay people a living wage. Because like, I'm not a full-time journalist anymore because I literally couldn't afford it. I already talked to you. Yell it out. So um, I really enjoyed your thoughts on cognition and how that impacts political behavior. It's an interesting field. It's also super depressing because it's always about how we try to avoid things that make us uncomfortable uh, at base. And I'm wondering if there are any kind of like healthy ways you'd encourage us to make ourselves uncomfortable Ooh. over the next few years. That is a good question. Yeah, you know, um, this, is, this has come up a lot in sort of like my, my friend spaces as people are trying to be like better, you know, friends and allies or whatever. Um, a huge part of that is identifying our own privileges and, and what like, and what like areas were, like what angles we're not coming from. Like I think a really important piece of work to do is if something resonates with you, again, like if you, if you feel yourself you know, not trusting a lawmaker, ask yourself why. If something really resonates with you, ask yourself why also. Because if something really confirms all of your biases, ask yourself why. Because that's the thing is like, what is that in you that you are looking to sort of have like lovingly stroked in your brain? Um, and what, why might that not be true for someone else? I think when we look at not just the journalists, but also the purported experts, particularly local media, yeah. it's almost exclusively white men. Uh, and you know, I think of like Marco Lowe, who I think is great, white dude, and then when you look at the p pictures he posts on his Facebook for his class day teaches, all of his guest lecturers are white dudes. Yeah. Um, are there ways that we as consumers of media can put more pressure on our media sources, uh, particularly our television media at the local level, sure. to actually diversify those voices and get different people who might have different experiences and, and can provide a uh, more um, broad view on what all these different things yeah. actually mean. Uh, call it out when you see it. Like, go, like, do. I dragged the Times one time on Twitter, and then they posted a correction the next day. So, like, call it out. Yeah, it was awesome. I wish that they had Maybe thanked me question. specifically. <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's not Danny Westy. Oh, no. He's a resident expert on racism, right? And everything. Poverty, too. He really knows a lot. Um, yeah, no, call it out when you see it. When you see an all, I think, I think call out the all male panels. Uh, when you see an expert, you know, the Chiron Reads expert, and you're like, like, send a tweet, send an email to the news director. Things will get changed. They don't want, and here's the other thing. Media outlets want you to trust them, right? Like, at the, like they want it. The incentive for them is for them to be trustworthy so that you will click on their articles, share their stuff, and watch their TV, right? So they want to be trustworthy. So if you telegraph to them, you are losing my trust because this is not representative, uh, you know, if enough people do it, they'll, they'll get there. You just have to keep whacking them on the nose. Maybe also positive things. And also positive things. And tell, yes, do, that's true. Do a little compliment sandwich if you have to. Uh, those work very well. Um, but yeah, and yeah, and share things that are good. And, and that's the other thing too, is as much as it's like, don't click on shit that sucks, do share things that, and, and, and like, if your weird grandma shares a crappy, fake news Facebook link, like share a cool local news link underneath it in the comments and be like, this is a better resource. And then you've like, that's a little, you know, that's a little everyday thing. Yeah, uh, I have a question, but wanted to say something like very right much what you're saying. Um, so I, I work in social media and I have for a long time. So like the, the idea that like, you know, these clicks mm -hmm. actually matter. Like, you know, people don't give a shit, they get paid money and they love it when you argue in their comment section yeah. because like, you, you might not make money off of Seattle-ish, but they for sure oh, make for money, sure. and those are 
the reports that they take to people. It's like, oh, look at what the comment, look at the engagement is. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk, don't talk about sentiment at all for that. So if oh, you do certainly. see amazing things like what you guys put out and, you know, like the Emerald and, you know, Evergrade, things like that, like make sure that not only are you, you know, loving it and liking it, but you're commenting it and you're sharing it. And well, and the more you comment on something, the more it's going to show up in your feed. So it's also just it also just makes your Facebook experience better. That's the other thing. If you keep getting shitty stuff in your Facebook feed, it's because you're engaging with it. Like Facebook knows, and so uh, creepy. super creepy, super. Uh, so yeah, when you when you like like if you like a page or if you like a post, you're more likely to see things from it. Yeah. Oh, it's true. When I worked in Morning Zoo Radio and we did, weren't having good engagement for the week, I did social media for Morning Zoo Radio. Uh, I would just post something about Miley Cyrus because I knew our commenters would go bad shit about it because they hated her they hated her but we also knew from the ppm that they would listen to the duration of all of her songs um and they would comment just like eh, me, 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 me. and i was just like yes give me those hate clicks uh so i am guilty of this as well <laughs> like i'm not you know i'm not i'm not innocent here all right what, what's your cue there's been a lot of this uh talk after the election about the importance of sort of engaging the other side um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the value doing that given how awful the society is. If you can, here's the thing, I'm like a really, so I'm a surprisingly non-controversial person. Um, I know, that would surprise you to hear. Um, I don't like doing things like that. If you can, if only because, so one thing I, um, I worked on the uh, Referendum 74 campaign, right, for marriage equality. and. Um, one of the things we learned was having direct experience with a loved one who was a member of the LGBTQ community was one of the most powerful things you could do to sway a voter, right? So whatever, like, you might not ever convince your drunk uncle at Christmas time to not be racist. You might be able to get him on board with raising the minimum wage. You might be able to get him on board with more progressive taxation if you can slip it in a little, again, a little compliment sandwich if you can just be like, no, it's just, uh, you know, schools. Um, and so I think if you can, if you have the wherewithal, like, do it, but uh, I don't know. I don't think, I think people are movable. I think it's cynical to believe that people are a lost cause, but I also think that it's uh, absolutely exhausting. And if that's where your finite resources are gonna go, like, maybe not, but. Okay, guys, that's it, I think. Thank you so much for coming. I love you all.